no subordinate can ever meet a higher mandarin in his way. The former must turn down some by-street immediately on hearing the approaching gong of his superior officer. A mandarin's rank can be told by the number of consecutive strokes on the gong, ranging from thirteen for a viceroy to seven for a magistrate. Take the case of a Chinese visitor. He should be received at the front door, and be conducted by the host to a reception room, the host being careful to see that the visitor is always slightly in advance. The act of sitting down should be simultaneous, so that neither party is standing while the other is seated. If the host wishes to be very attentive, he may take a cup of tea from his servant's hands and himself arrange it for his guest. Here comes another most important and universal rule. In handing anything to, or receiving anything from, an equal, both hands must be used. A servant should hand a cup of tea with both hands, except when serving his master and a guest. Then he takes one cup in each hand, and hands them with the arms crossed. I was told that the crossing was in order to exhibit to each the heart, i.e. the palm, of the hand in token of loyalty. There is a curious custom in connection with the invariable cup of tea served to a visitor on arrival, which is often violated by foreigners, to the great amusement of the Chinese. The tea in question, known as guest tea, is not intended for ordinary drinking purposes, for which wine is usually provided. No sooner does the guest raise the cup of tea to his lips, or even touch it with his hand, than a shout is heard from the servants, which means that the interview is at an end, and that the visitor's sedan chair is to be got ready. Drinking this tea is in fact a signal for departure. The host may similarly, without breach of good manners, be the first to drink, and thus delicately notify the guest that he has business engagements elsewhere. Then again, it is the rule to place the guest at one's left hand, though curiously enough this only dates from the middle of the fourteenth century, previous to which the right hand was the place of honour. Finally, when the guest takes his leave, it is proper to escort him back to the front door. That, at any rate, is sufficient, though it is not unusual to accompany a guest some part of his return journey. In fact, the Chinese proverb says, If you escort a man at all, escort him all the way. This, however, is rhetorical rather than practical, somewhat after the style of another well-known Chinese proverb. If you bow at all, bow low. A Chinese invitation to dinner differs somewhat from a similar compliment in the West. You will receive a red envelope containing a red card, red being the colour associated with festivity, on which it is stated that by noon on a given day the floor will be swept, the wine cups washed, and your host in waiting to meet your chariot. Later on a second invitation will arrive, couched in the same terms, and again another on the day of the banquet, asking you to be punctual to the minute. To this you pay no attention, but make preparations to arrive at about 4 p.m., previous to which another and more urgent summons may very possibly have been sent. All this is conventional, and the guests assemble at the same hour to separate about 9 p.m., Women take no part in Chinese social entertainments, except among their own sex. It is not even permissible to inquire after the wife of one's host. Her very existence is ignored. A man will talk with pleasure about his children, especially if his quiver is well stocked with boys. In this connection I may say that the position of women in China still seems to be very widely misunderstood. Not only that, but a very frightful crime is alleged against the Chinese people as a common practice in everyday life, which, if not actually approved, meets everywhere with toleration. I allude to the charge of infanticide, confined of course to girls, 
for it has not often been suggested that Chinese parents do away with such a valuable asset as a boy. Miss Gordon Cumming, the traveller, in her wanderings in China, has the following impassioned paragraph in reference to her visit to Ningbo. Some of these poor little creatures are brought here alive and left to die, and some of these have been rescued and carried to foundling hospitals. The neighbourhood was so pestiferous that we could only pause a moment to look at an institution, which, although so horrible, is so characteristic of this race, who pay such unbounded reverence to the powerful dead who could harm them. Most of the bodies deposited here are those of girl babies, who have been intentionally put to death, but older children are often thrown in. With regard to this, I will only say that I lived altogether for over four years within a mile or so of these towers, which I frequently passed during the evening walk, and so far from ever seeing several poor uncoffined mites lying outside the towers, shrouded only in a morsel of old matting, which Miss Gordon Cumming has described, I never even saw one single instance of a tower being put to the purpose for which it was built, viz., as a burying place for the dead infants of people too poor to spend money upon a grave. As for living children being thrown in, I think I shall be able to dispose of that statement a little later on. Miss Gordon Cumming did not add that these towers are cleared out at regular intervals by a Chinese charitable society, which exists for that purpose. The bodies burnt, and the ashes reverently buried. The delicate fragrance of the roses and honeysuckle, alas, cannot overpower the appalling odours which here and there assail us, poisoning the freshness of the evening breezes. These are wafted from the baby towers, two of which we had to pass. These are square towers with small windows, about twelve feet from the ground, somewhat resembling pigeon towers. These strange dovecotes are built to receive the bodies of such babies as die too young to have fully developed souls, and therefore there is no necessity to waste coffins on them, or even to make the trouble of burying them in the bosom of Mother Earth. So the insignificant little corpse is handed over to a coolie, who, for the sum of forty cash, equal to about five cents, carries it away, ostensibly to throw it into one of these towers. But if he should not choose to go so far, he gets rid of it somehow. No questions are asked, and there are plenty of prowling dogs ever on the watch, seeking what they may devour. Today several poor uncoffined mites were lying outside the towers, shrouded only in a morsel of old matting. Apparently they had been brought by someone who had failed to throw them in at the window about twelve feet from the ground, in which, by the way, one had stuck fast. Some of these poor little creatures are brought here alive and left to die, and some of these have been rescued and carried to foundling hospitals. The neighbourhood was so pestiferous that we could only pause a moment to look at an institution, which, although so horrible, is so characteristic of this race, who pay such unbounded reverence to the powerful dead who could harm them. Most of the bodies deposited here are those of girl babies who have been intentionally put to death, but older children are often thrown in. With regard to this, I will only say that I lived altogether for over four years within a mile or so of these towers, which I frequently passed during the evening walk, and so far from ever seeing several poor uncoffined mites lying outside the towers, shrouded only in a morsel of old matting, which Miss Gordon Cumming has described, I never even saw one single instance of a tower being put to the purpose for which it was built, viz., as a burying place for the dead infants of people too poor to spend money upon a grave. As for living children being thrown in, I think I shall be able to dispose of that statement a little later on. 
Miss Gordon Cumming did not add that these towers are cleared out at regular intervals by a Chinese charitable society, which exists for that purpose, the bodies burnt, and the ashes reverently buried. Mrs. Bird Bishop, the traveller, is reported to have stated at a public lecture in 1897 that one of the most distressing features of Chinese life was the contempt for women. Of eleven Bible women whom she had seen at a meeting in China, there was not one who had not put an end to at least five girl babies. A Jesuit missionary has published a quarto volume, running to more than 270 pages, and containing many illustrations of infanticide, and the judgments of heaven which always come upon those who commit this crime. Finally, if you ask of any Chinaman, he will infallibly tell you that infanticide exists to an enormous extent everywhere in China. And as though in corroboration of his words, alongside many a pool in South China may be found a stone tablet bearing an inscription to the effect that female children may not be drowned here. This would appear to end the discussion, but it does not. To begin with, the Chinese are very prone to exaggerate, especially to foreigners, even their vices. They seem to think that some credit may be extracted from anything, provided it is on a sufficiently imposing scale, and I do not at all doubt the fact that eleven Bible women told Mrs. Bird Bishop that they had each destroyed five girl babies. It is just what I should have expected. I remember when I first went to Amoy, it had been stated in print by a reckless foreigner that crucifixion of a most horrible kind was one of the common punishments of the place. On inquiring from the Chinese writer attached to the consulate, the man assured me that the story was quite true, and that I could easily see for myself. I told him that I was very anxious to do so, and promised him a hundred dollars for the first case he might bring to my notice. Three years later I left Amoy, with the hundred dollars still unclaimed. Further, those Chinese who have any money to spare are much given to good works chiefly, I feel bound to add, in view of the recompense their descendants will receive in this world, and they themselves in the next. Also, because a rich man who does nothing in the way of charity comes to be regarded with disapprobation by his poorer neighbours. Such persons print and circulate gratis all kinds of religious tracts against gambling, wine-drinking, opium-smoking, infanticide, and so forth. And these are the persons who set up the stone tablets above mentioned, regardless of whether infanticide happens to be practised or not. Of course, infanticide is known in China, just as it is known, too well known, in England and elsewhere. What I hope to be able to show is that infanticide is not more prevalent in China than in the Christian communities of the West. Let me begin by urging what no one who has lived in China will deny, that Chinese parents seem to be excessively fond of all their children, male and female. A son is often spoken of playfully as a little dog, a puppy in fact. A girl is often spoken of as a thousand ounces of gold, a jewel, and so forth. Sons are no doubt preferred, but is that feeling peculiar to the Chinese? A great deal too much has been made of a passage in the Odes, which says that baby sons should have scepters to play with, while baby daughters should have tiles. The allotment of these toys is not quite so disparaging as it seems. The scepter is indeed the symbol of rule, but the tile too has an honourable signification a tile being used in ancient China as a weight for the spindle, and consequently as a symbol of woman's work in the household. Then again, even a girl has a market value. Some will buy and rear them to be servants, 
others to be wives for their sons. While native foundling hospitals endowed by charitable Chinese will actually pay a small fee for every girl handed over to them. It is also curious to note how recent careful observers have several times stated that they can find no trace of infanticide in their own immediate districts, though they hear that it is extensively practiced in some other, generally distant, parts of the country. After all, it is really a question which can be decided inferentially by statistics. Every Chinese youth, when he reaches the age of eighteen, has a sacred duty to perform. He must marry. Broadly speaking, every adult Chinaman in the empire has a wife. Well-to-do merchants, mandarins and others, have subordinate wives, two, three, and even four. The emperor has seventy-two. This being the case, and granting also a widespread destruction of female children, it must follow that girls are born in an overwhelmingly large proportion to boys, utterly unheard of in any other part of the world. Are, then, Chinese women the downtrodden, degraded creatures we used to imagine Muslim women to be? I think this question must be answered in the negative. The young Chinese woman in a well-to-do establishment is indeed secluded, in the sense that her circle is limited to the family and to men's of the same sex. From time immemorial it has been the rule in China that men and women should not pass things to one another, for fear their hands might touch. A local Pharisee tried to entangle the great Mencius in his speech, asking him if a man who saw his sister-in-law drowning might venture to pull her out. A man, replied the philosopher, who failed to do so would be no better than a wolf. The Chinese lady may go out to pay calls, and even visit temples for religious purposes, unveiled, veils for women having been abolished in the first years of the seventh century of our era. Only brides wear them now. Girls are finally separated from boys at seven or eight years of age, when the latter go to school. Some say that Chinese girls receive no education. If so, what is the explanation of the large educational literature provided exclusively for girls? One Chinese authoress, who wrote a work on the education of women, complains that women can never expect more than ten years for their education, i.e. the years between childhood and marriage. The fact is that among the literary classes, girls often receive a fair education, as witness the mass of poetry published by Chinese women. One of the dynastic histories was partly written by a woman. Her brother, who was engaged on it, died, and she completed his work. About the year 235 AD, women were actually admitted to official life, and some of them rose to important government posts. By the 8th century, however, all trace of this system had disappeared. The women of the poorer classes are not educated at all, nor indeed are the men. Both sexes have to work as burden carriers and field labourers, and of course in such cases the restrictions mentioned above cannot be rigorously enforced. Women of the shopkeeper class often display great aptitude for business, and render invaluable assistance to their husbands. As in France, they usually keep the cash box. A mandarin's seal of office is his most important possession. If he loses it, he may lose his post. Without the seal, nothing can be done. With it, everything. Extraordinary precautions are taken when transmitting new seals from Peking to the provinces. Every official seal is made with four small feet projecting from the four corners of its face, making it look like a small table. Of these, the maker breaks off one when he hands the seal over to the board. Before forwarding to the viceroy of the province, another foot is removed by the board. A third is similarly disposed of by the viceroy. 
and the last by the official for whose use it is intended. This is to prevent its employment by any other than the person authorised. The seal is then handed over to the Mandarin's wife, in whose charge it always remains, she alone having the power to produce it, or withhold it, as required. A Chinese woman shares the titles accorded to her husband. When the latter is promoted, the title of the wife is correspondingly advanced. She also shares all posthumous honours, and her spirit, equally with her husband's, is soothed by the ceremonies of ancestral worship. Ancestral worship is a phrase of ominous import, suggesting as it does the famous dispute which began to rage early in the eighteenth century and is still raging today. In every Chinese house stand small wooden tablets, bearing the names of deceased parents, grandparents, and earlier ancestors. Plates of meat and cups of wine are on certain occasions set before these tablets, in the belief that the spirits of the dead occupy the tablets and enjoy the offerings. The latter are afterward eaten by the family, but pious Chinese assert that the flavour of the food and wine has been abstracted. Similar offerings are made once a year at the tombs where the family ancestors lie buried. The question now arises, are these offerings set forth in the same spirit which prompts us to place flowers on graves, adorn statues, and hold memorial services? If so, a Chinese convert to Christianity may well be permitted to embody these old observances with the ceremonial of his new faith. Or do these observances really constitute worship? That is, are the offerings made with a view to propitiate the spirits of the dead and obtain from them increase of worldly prosperity and happiness? In the latter case, ministers of the Christian faith would of course be justified in refusing to blend ancestral worship with the teachings of Christianity. It would no doubt be very desirable to bring about a compromise and discover some modus vivendi for the Chinese convert, other than that of throwing over Confucianism with all its influence for good, and of severing all family and social ties, and beginning life again as an outcast in his own country. But I feel bound to say that in my opinion these ancestral observances can only be regarded, strictly speaking, as worship and as nothing else. To return to the Chinese woman, she enjoys some privileges not shared by men. She is exempt from the punishment of the bamboo, and as a party to a case, is always more or less a source of anxiety to the presiding magistrate. No Chinaman will enter into a dispute with a woman if he can help it, not from any chivalrous feeling, but from a conviction that he will surely be worsted in the end. If she becomes a widow, a Chinese woman is not supposed to marry again, though in practice she very often does so. A widow who remains unmarried for thirty years may be recommended to the throne for some mark of favour, such as an honorary tablet or an ornamental archway to be put up near her home. It is essential, however, that her widowhood should have begun before she was thirty years of age. Remarriage is viewed by many widows with horror. In my own family I once employed a nurse, herself one of seven sisters, who was a widow, and who had also lost half the little finger of her left hand. The connecting link between these two details is not so apparent to us as it might be to the Chinese. After her husband's death the widow decided that she would never marry again, and in order to seal irrevocably her vow, she seized a meat chopper and lopped off half her finger on the spot. The finger top was placed in her husband's coffin, and the lid was closed. This woman, who was a Christian, and the widow of a native preacher, had large, that is, unbound feet. Nevertheless, she bound the feet of her only daughter, because, as she explained, 
it is so difficult to get a girl married unless she has small feet. Here we have the real obstacle to the abolition of this horrible custom, which vast numbers of intelligent Chinese would be only too glad to get rid of if fashion did not stand in the way. There has been in existence now for some years a well-meaning association known as the Natural Foot Society, supported by both Chinese and foreigners, with the avowed object of putting an end to the practice of foot-binding. We hear favourable accounts of its progress, but until there is something like a national movement, it will not do to be too sanguine. We must remember that in 1664, one of China's wisest and greatest emperors, in the plenitude of his power, issued an imperial edict forbidding parents in future to bind the feet of their girls. Four years later, the edict was withdrawn. The emperor was Kang Si, whose name you have already heard, in connection with the standard dictionary of the Chinese language, and other works brought out under his patronage. A Tartar himself, unaccustomed to the sight of Tartar women struggling in such fetters, he had no sympathy with the custom. But against the Chinese people, banded together to safeguard their liberty of action in a purely domestic matter, he was quite unable to prevail. Within the last few weeks, another edict has gone forth, directed against the practice of foot-binding. Let us hope it will have a better fate. Many years ago, the prefect of Taiwan Fu said to me, in the course of an informal conversation, after a friendly dinner, Do you foreigners fear the inner ones? And on my asking what was meant, he told me that a great many Chinese stood in absolute awe of their wives. He does, added the prefect, pointing to the district magistrate, a rather truculent-looking individual, who was at the dinner party, and the other guests went into a roar of laughter. The general statement by the prefect is borne out by the fact that the henpecked husband is constantly held up to ridicule in humorous literature which would be quite impossible if there were no foundation of fact. I have translated one of these stories, trivial enough in itself, but, like the proverbial straw, well adapted for showing which way the wind blows. Here it is. Ten henpecked husbands agreed to form themselves into a society for resisting the oppression of their wives. At the first meeting they were sitting talking over their pipes, when suddenly the ten wives, who had got wind of the movement, appeared on the scene. There was a general stampede, and nine of the husbands incontinently bolted through another door, only one remaining unmoved to face the music. The ladies merely smiled contemptuously at the success of their raid, and went away. The nine husbands then all agreed that the bold tenth man, who had not run away, should be at once appointed their president, but on coming to offer him the post, they found out that he had died of fright. To judge by the following story, the Chinese woman's patience is sometimes put to a severe test. A scholar of old was so absent-minded that on one occasion, when he was changing houses, he forgot to take his wife. This was reported to Confucius as a most unworthy act. Nay, replied the master, it is indeed bad to forget one's wife, but tis worse to forget one's self. Points of this kind are no doubt trivial, as I have said above, and may be regarded by many even as flippant, but the fact is that a successful study of the Chinese people cannot possibly be confined to their classics and higher literature, and to the problem of their origin and subsequent development, where we now find them, it must embrace the lesser, not to say meaner, details of their everyday life, if we are ever to pierce the mystery which still to a great extent surrounds them. In this sense, an Italian student of Chinese, Baron Vitale, has gone so far as to put together and publish a collection of Chinese nursery rhymes, 
from which it is not difficult to infer that Chinese babies are very much as other babies are in other parts of the world. And it has always seemed to me that the Chinese baby's father and mother, so far as the ordinary springs of action go, are very much of a pattern with the rest of mankind. One reason why the Chinaman remains a mystery to so many is due, no doubt, to the vast amount of nonsense which is published about him. First of all, China is a very large country, and from want of proper means of communication for many centuries, there has been nothing like extensive intercourse between north, south, east, west, and central. Of course, the officials visit all parts of the empire, as they are transferred from post to post, but the bulk of the people never go far beyond the range of their own district city. The consequence is that as regards manners and customs, while retaining an indelible national imprint, the Chinese people have drifted apart into separate local communities, so that what is true of one part of the country is by no means necessarily true of another. The Chinese themselves say that manners, which they think are due to climatic influences, change every thirty miles. Customs, which they attribute to local idiosyncrasies, change every three hundred miles. Now a globetrotter goes to Canton, and as one of the sites of that huge collection of human beings, he is taken to shops, uh, there used to be three, where the flesh of dogs, fed for the purpose, is sold as food. He comes home and writes a book and says that the Chinese people live on dog's flesh. When I was a boy, I thought that every Frenchman had a frog for breakfast. Each statement would be about equally true. In the north of China, dog's flesh is unknown, and even in the south, during all my years in China, I never succeeded in finding any Chinaman who either could or would admit that he had actually tasted it. Take the random statement that any rich man condemned to death can procure a substitute by payment of so much. So long as we believe stuff of that kind, so long will the Chinese remain a mystery to us, it being difficult to deduce true conclusions from false premises. As a matter of fact, that is, so far as my own observations go, the Chinese people value life every whit as highly as we do, and a substitute of the kind would be quite unprocurable under ordinary circumstances. It is thinkable that some poor wretch, himself under sentence of death, might be substituted with the connivance of the officials to hoodwink foreigners, but even then the difficulties would be so great as to render the scheme almost impracticable. For in China everything leaks out. There is none of that secrecy necessary to conceal and carry out such a plot. At any rate, the uncertainty which gathers around many of these points emphasizes the necessity of more and more accurate scholarship in Chinese and more and more accurate information on the people of China and their ways. How the latter article is supplied to us in England you may judge from some extracts which I have recently taken from respectable daily and weekly newspapers. For instance, China has only 100 physicians to a population of 400 million. To me it is inconceivable how such rubbish can be printed, especially when it is quite easy to find out that there is no medical diploma in China, and that any man who chooses is free to set up as a doctor. By a pleasant fiction he charges no fee. A fixed sum, however, is paid to him for each visit, as horse money, I need hardly add, in advance. There are, as with us, many successful and consequently fashionable doctors whose horse money runs well into double figures. Their success must be due more to good luck and strictly innocent prescriptions than to any guidance they can find in the extensive medical literature of China. Altogether, medicine is a somewhat risky profession, as failure to cure is occasionally resented by surviving relatives. There is a story of a doctor 
who had mismanaged a case, and was seized by the patient's family and tied up. In the night he managed to free himself, and escaped by swimming across a river. When he got home he found his son, who had just begun to study medicine, and he said to him, "'Don't be in a hurry with your books. The first and most important thing is to learn to swim.' Here is another newspaper gem. In China, the land of opposites, the dials of the clocks are made to turn round, while the hands stand still. Personally, I never noticed this arrangement. Again, some of the tops with which the Chinese amuse themselves are as large as barrels. It takes three men to spin one, and it gives off a sound that may be heard several hundred yards away. The Chinese national anthem is so long that it takes half a day to sing it. Chinese women devote very little superfluous time to hairdressing. Their tresses are arranged once a month, and they sleep with their heads in boxes. What we want in place of all this is a serious and systematic examination of the manners and customs and modes of thought of the Chinese people. their long line of dynastic histories must be explored, and their literature ransacked by students who have got through the early years of drudgery, inseparable from the peculiar manner of the written language, and who are prepared to devote themselves, not as we do now, to a general knowledge of the whole, but to a thorough acquaintance with some particular branch. The immediate advantages of such a course, as I must point out once more, for the last time, to commerce and to diplomatic relations will be incalculable, and they will be shared in by the student of history, philosophy and religion, who will then, for the first time, be able to assign to China her proper place in the family of nations. The founder of this Chinese chair has placed these advantages within the grasp of Columbia University.